Hello and welcome back to my video podcast on the future of business and technology. I'm Bernard Ma and today we're exploring a fascinating transformation in how organizations work with technology. Thanks to AI making technology more intuitive and human friendly, we're seeing a revolution where employees across all departments are becoming technology creators. It's no longer just IT professionals writing code. Now AI is helping marketing managers build analytical models, nurses develop healthcare apps, and finance teams create their own automation solutions. To help me explore this topic, I'm joined today by Tom Davenport, distinguished professor at Babson College and author of many books, including the best-selling Competing on Analytics, along with Ian Barking, a pioneering thought leader in automation and digital transformation. We're here to discuss their new book, All Hands on Tech, the AI-powered citizen revolution, which explores how AI is democratizing technology and transforming the future of work. Tom, Ian, welcome to my show. Thanks for having us, Bernard. Happy to be here. Yep, great to yeah. be here. Good to have you here again, Tom. Lovely to have you here, Ian. Um, where are you joining us from today? I'm on Cape Cod, um, where it's unseasonably warm. I guess it's unseasonably warm in many places these days. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and I'm in Tampa, Florida, where it's always unseasonably warm. <laughs> but uh, but it is very humid this morning. It was quite warm. Very good. Thank you for joining me and thank you for giving me your book to read before it came out i when i read it i thought this is a topic that should have been much more on my radar it's something that we are seeing every day but actually looking at some of the the challenges that come within the opportunities i really enjoyed this so in the book you argue that we are in a in an unprecedented time in the 70 years history of business IT. Maybe you can explain why this citizen revolution is so transformative and why it is happening now. Tom, do you want to kick this off? Sure. Um, you know, I think this has been, as you suggest, Bernard, creeping up on us over time. Um, we've had, you know, people doing really powerful analysis on Excel with macros and the low code, no code um, uh, programming mm -hmm. um, activity has been growing, I would say, slowly over time. I can remember um, in my youth, people were starting to talk about fourth generation and fifth generation languages that made it easier for non-professionals to, to do work. But I think we have crossed the line toward much more of this, um, AI is a factor. Um, all these other tools have been slowly getting easier to use over time. You know, um, one of my primary interests is in the data science area. And for a while now, we've had this idea of automated machine learning even before generative AI came along. And now you can get a machine learning model by simply saying, you know, create a machine learning model for me that tries to predict this variable and it'll give you three pages of analysis and try a lot of different algorithm types and so on. So um, um, maybe AI has made it the tipping point, but the fact is, you know, technology has gotten so much easier to use. And, you know, we all um, carry around very powerful devices in our pockets that we have to become familiar with if you're going to negotiate modern life. And I think that that makes all of us more interested in using these tools as they become available. Very true, very true. Anything to add, Ian? Oh, as, as Tom said, for, for as long as there's been technology and enterprise, we have been given tools to use to do our jobs. And as we, as we explore in the book, the concept that humans are becoming more tech savvy and more technical and more comfortable with technology is, as Tom just said, and technology is becoming progressively more and more human and human friendly We're to the point where so much attention is given to prompting and just effectively speaking to a computer and saying, this is what I'd like you to build for me. 
uh, that inflection point turns us from being given tech to do our jobs with to being able to solve problems we know inherently we face because we do our jobs and we'd love to see solutions that handle you, you name it, everything from data analysis and cleaning to uh, just automation. And as Tom said, he he focuses on on more of the data side. My background has been in more of the automation, uh, the robotic process automation, and then progressively the intelligent automation space. And the narrative in that space for a long time was that that set of technologies was so easy that business analysts could use it. Uh, but unfortunately, it was more of a sort of marketing and sales pitch than reality. Uh, it was still quite a bit harder than a business analyst was equipped to to be building in. Uh, but that is changing now. And that's what motivated us to explore the topic and to write the book. Mm, and in the book, you describe three main types of citizens, developers, automators, and data scientists. Um, maybe Ian, you can give us an overview of how they differ and maybe some good examples. Maybe we leave the data science one for, for Tom to describe. If you can give us your favorite examples mm -hmm. of the, the, the automators and the developers, that would be amazing. Perfect. Yep. Thank you for, for leaving the data science one for, for the <laughs> expert. Um, and it's interesting. We, in our exploration, in our interviews with dozens and dozens of enterprises, we sort of, we went back and forth on the number and type of citizens that there really were. And so there are three that we settled on primarily, and we'll talk about those, but um, we also give sort of recognition and credence to some of the other quote unquote citizenry, effectively sort of the non-trained experts who can now do things that they couldn't do before. Uh, and so some of, and I'll just sort of lead in because we talked about sort of citizen scouts, people who are now able to look around their job in whatever department they're in and say, you know what, based on what I know now, what I've been told about what technology can do, this feels like a candidate for automation. Uh, even if they, they don't end up doing it themselves, right? Even if they don't, right? They're literally the ones that are just the guide. They've got that sort of, they've got the divining rod that says over here feels good. Maybe we should dig. And then you get to our, our three. And so, as you said, there's citizen automator and citizen developer. So the the automator was really an homage to the RPA heritage and history because RPA for the most part was integrating where integrations didn't exist. And so an enterprise in their HR department, for instance, would be using multiple systems. Anybody in any operation knows this reality. You've got lots of systems and the outsourcing industry, which was my original career, the outsourcing industry would do what we would used to call swivel chair integration, where people would just sit there and look at two monitors and pull data from this one and put it in this one, this system and put it into that system. And so there were no APIs, there was no glue between these systems, humans were that glue. And so that's where RPA was really born in these back office operation systems where they just needed integrations. And those integrations would, expand and start to do more and more of a workflow in the steps that were digital and automatable. So that's citizen automators, people who are effectively doing that with RPA or with newer, more powerful versions of, of that sort of executional automation. And then citizen developers was less about glue and more about app development. And so there are platforms like, like the Power Platform that has Power Apps where people can not just look at a gap between two systems, but realize they need a system. They need something that does payroll or does tracking of shipments of goods or something. And they're able to now develop that application, that full functioning tool, uh, because tools are easier and they can start to drag and drop and that low and no code concept, they can build this functionality to get that work done. So that's the citizen automator and citizen developer. Amazing. Now, and Tom, do you want to talk about the third one, the, the data scientist one? Sure. Um, and I, I think we would in, include data analysis in this um, category because it's hard, hard to draw the line between what's a data analyst and what's a data scientist. But um, the tools now allow for anything in that range and even tools that were conventionally quite oriented to 
just data analysis um, uh, from Excel to Tableau to Click all have machine learning capabilities now. Um, you also have the, um, as I mentioned earlier, the rise of these automated machine learning tools from companies like H2O and Data Robot and so on um, that can um, you know, test out a hundred different algorithms within a minute or two um, and see which one fits your data best. And then, um, as I was saying, I think AI is um, increasingly capable, generative AI is increasingly capable of, of specifying a machine learning model. For some reason, it's been relatively slow, I think, to take off among the capabilities of generative AI, but OpenAI's had it for a while, Anthropic just announced that capability. Um, so um, we, in our research, saw companies that did this before AI, AT&T, for example, which has a huge um, uh, program oriented to um, citizen data science with, I think, um, a feature store with 27,000 features in it that people can use predefined features, you know, if you want to predict attrition, you know, there are several different versions of attrition that you can, you can choose from. Um, uh, I think they have 475 data science courses you can be trained on. Uh, they have a big community of, of um, citizen data science de developers. As in many organizations, they do also have data science professionals. And I think in many cases, you know, if you're doing something really critical to your organization's success or to your to your customer success, or it has regulatory implications, you probably want to run it, run your analysis by a um, professional data scientist in the same way you would a professional developer if you were a citizen developer of, of a really important application. But um, you can do more and more on your own. And we encountered organizations like AT&T and Microsoft and Johnson and Johnson and so on, where non-data scientists are increasingly doing quite sophisticated data science work. Yeah, and I I think in this whole data science or an analyst community, I think it's completely democratizing access to data, which is very exciting. Um, you've interviewed lots of different citizen developers for your book. Whose story surprised you or inspired you the most, Ian? Uh, it's a good question. So <clears throat> to use Tom's phrase, if you can do more, um, ultimately we, we wrote this book for two different audiences because we were sort of inspired for them. And then I'll, I'll get to some of the specific ones that inspired us. Uh, but the C-suite, the CTO, IO, and you know, data officer, automation officer, and the CEO can now do more because they've got a, a much larger cast of characters that they can they can trust and lean on to actually be coming up with ideas and developing. And the humans, the these potential citizens, the non-technical uh, staff can do more because they can turn their ideas into actions. And we saw a few, there was one in Shell, for instance, a, a gentleman named Stevie Sims, who uh, had this great story of really being in the in the fields, like he was literally turning in valves field. for a living. He described it as I right. think. Yeah. turning valves. Like you, you can't get more in the trenches than, than Stevie was. And he was then given the opportunity to start playing with these tools. And you saw domain expertise leveraged. You saw uh, a, an intelligent person who knew the business and understood the challenges operating in that environment, who was then able to turn those ideas into actions and created automations that then inspired a movement. Uh, and so there, there are a lot more that followed in his footsteps. He's a coach and a, a guide within Shell now. Um, they called it something different. They called it uh, DIY, do it yourself rather than citizen um, for various just naming reasons. They were afraid people would think they were being taught how to vote um, <laughs> if they called it citizen. <laughs> yeah, there were, there were, we found we found different uh, organizations chose different names for this concept for various reasons. Um, but 
DV is stood out as as a as a real shining example of of somebody who who got the business, who was given the opportunity, took it and ran with it with enthusiasm, and now is a is both a champion and a coach internally and a champion externally, right? And hopefully others read his story and are inspired that they can do more. And that in this age of AI, where there's always going to be concern and fear around it putting us out of work, this is actually stating that there's a tremendous amount of work and opportunity that that this democratization creates for people. Yeah, super interesting. I, I've recently spoken to Boston Consulting Group. I had them on my podcast and they now have made a large language model available to all of their employees. And they literally have created in, in just months, uh, created over 3000 different GPTs for different purposes, just mind boggling to, to right. see. Well, Tom, it, yeah, sorry, Tom, sorry. Do, do you have, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that just reminds me of operationally in the last several decades, the, what we would have done that, that coursework would have been everybody trained as a yellow and green belt in Six Sigma and taught how to identify opportunities operationally and how to build models and figure out Pareto, et cetera. And, and now, you know, the coursework changes, the, the class, the students are the same and the power is just so much greater. And that's, what's really interesting about this. this evolution. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, Tom, there's an interesting tension that this creates. We are letting people lose with these tools, but in the past we had IT departments as the gatekeepers. Um, how do organizations best manage this relationship between IT and citizen developers? Well, it's funny. I thought you were going to ask me my most inspiring citizen and the ter term I was going to use was let me inject some tension into the situation. <laughs> because why, why, why don't we start with that? Why don't you yeah. give us your most inspiring one? Um, yeah, well, um, this everything doesn't always go swimmingly in this world of citizen development. And you know, I really have to commend Shell for providing the air cover. Jay Crotz, the former CIO, really kicked this off and and it was a perfectly, you know, acceptable, authorized, encouraged activity. Um, we also start the book um, with an example of someone called Mr. Citizen, because uh, we were threatened with a lawsuit if we actually revealed his name, even though he's all over social media. I, I suspect, um, you know, like some anonymous authors, um, you can figure out um, who Mr. Citizen is if you work at it a bit. But um, uh, Mr. Citizen works in the supply chain area at a consumer products company, a well-known consumer products company, and um, he um, uh, he does a lot of production forecasting and, and demand forecasting and so on, trying to match them up, and the, particularly in that area of, of demand forecasting, you're pulling information from a lot of different domains and he was spending you know days and days uh, doing it in excel you know um manually entering data into excel and then um he discovered this tool called alterix which um is a data analysis tool but at, at the time its primary focus was kind of a data blending tool and he said i went from you know doing this in days to doing it in minutes basically i can pull all the data together make me much more productive and so on. But the IT organization at Mr. Citizen's company was not terribly supportive of this. They kept saying, well, you know, why do it in Alteryx? You could program it in Python. He said, I don't program in Python. I don't know how to use Python. Um, and so um, they um, at various times tried to sort of quash the use of Alteryx. They're still trying, I gather. Um, and uh, um, never really supported citizen development. A new CIO came in and seemed to be um, at least open to the idea, but um, fell short of, of really encouraging that activity. So um, this um, can be, I don't think it's necessarily hazardous to your career. Um, it makes people productive enough so they can typically withstand um, uh, any uh, pushback from the IT department. 
Uh, your direct boss is usually dazzled by what you can produce in such a short time with these tools, but um, it doesn't always go um, easily, at least at the moment. I hope that will change over time. Yeah, which is perfect leads me to the question I was was asking you the tension between IT departments and citizen developers and how organizations best manage those relationships. I, I can go ahead on some of that. Yeah, because because ultimately, this concept, the citizen development concept is not new, and it got a lot of attention a few years ago. And if you ask any CTO, CIO, they'll roll their eyes at you and say that this is dangerous and didn't work and created a bunch of technical debt and shadow IT or gray IT. And to some extent, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy because as Tom said, if you don't support it and you fight it and you give no air cover or no training or no sandboxes and safe spaces to turn ideas into actions, then then you're driving it into the shadows and it will be done in a way that creates gray IT and, and uh, technical debt. And so that's, that's a big tension. And so part of the message in our book effectively, and we have a framework that, that speaks to it too, is you're not stopping this, right? If you think you can stop the ingenuity and problem solving of your teams of people who both have the ideas and then the tenacity to pursue them to solve problems they face every day. If you think you can squash that, good luck. Yeah. And if you think that the answer, as Tom said, if you think the answer is the tool you have, right? If I have a hammer, everything is a nail. If I have Python programmers, everything is a homegrown Python program. And that's also not going to hold water just because you don't have an infinite number of Python programmers and the history of this dialogue between business and IT was always IT doesn't listen to me or they don't give me the time of day or they put me on a roadmap that's three to five years out and I can't wait that long. Or they tell me that, that if I don't understand the problem and they know how to fix it with the tools they have and they'll, they'll solve it better. And so those dynamics will persist unless you recognize you need to put in a better structure that capitalizes on the fact that your people want to be solving problems and being creative and the tools have gotten so much easier that they really can solve some pretty complex problems these days. Yeah. And that, that in the end, that's a good thing. You want people to do that. You want people to be engaged and look for tools that can make them more productive. Um, I have recently written an article and uh, done a video on shadow AI, something I see every day in organizations that, exactly. that lots of employees are using AI tools to become more creative, more productive. Um, but there's this tension. Do we control this? Do we stop this? Do we let people go? Do we give them a sandboxed version of it? So it's there's, an interesting challenge. There's a funny story that came out in a few different discussions where this shadow AI uh, popped up in companies that we were interviewing, where all of a sudden the staff was using various different AI tools. The CIO was was shocked to find it, started to go about the process of figuring out how did this happen? Who let this happen? And the answer was you did when you signed up for the new Office 365 license that gave everybody Copilot. <laughs> and so, so some of this, some of this- Or, just, or yeah, Power Platform, or which power, also yes. comes along with some of those licenses. Yeah. Right. Just inadvertently, you turned on the citizenry uh, even though you didn't realize you were doing it. And now you have to decide whether you, you, you take the tool back or, or you're more productive. Cause as you said, you've got so many people who are really, really eager to do something. You give them the tools, they're going to do something. Mm, absolutely. In, in the book, you paint this picture of future IT functions being more about coaching and assessment than development. How should chief information officers be preparing for this shift? I think if you take a look at, at what Shell has already done, you know, they have thousands of citizen developers of various types. They have how many, 40 or 50 different coaches around the organization, I think, Ian. Right. Um, they've um, produced a set of, of guidelines um, that is 
increasingly common among organizations adopting citizen development is the sort of red, yellow, green, or in the UK, red, amber, green, um, where you um, are saying, okay, if very few people are using it, you're not using um, any restricted data, great, do whatever you want. Um, if it's a mission critical and you are using data that um, shouldn't be tampered with, that's red, um, turn it over to IT. Um, if it's yellow or amber, then you know maybe we'll have a collaboration between you and um, the IT organization. Maybe we'll make sure that the, you're treating the data well and that um, you've just documented what you're doing in case you end up leaving or there um, some organizations have a restriction where um, there can never be only one person who knows how this application works. Um, but um, I think those kinds of guidelines and, and governance approaches um, are, are really quite important. Um, uh, we also think guidance in the form of um, education and coaching and so on is critical. So um, even though we did not find, I think, a single example of a disaster that had resulted from citizen development. We talked to over 50 companies and um, um, more than twice that many individuals. Um, nobody said this almost brought down my company. Um, you, you want to prevent that through the use of these approaches. Yeah, so, and I can see lots of risks there. There's data leakage risks, there's security risks. Um, what, what are the biggest risks organizations face when embracing citizen development and how can you start mitigating those? I, th I think those are fair. I mean, as Tom said, that red, yellow, green model, what it actually did too is it turned you, I, it, it, you started as a scout, right? a citizen scout that said, I've got this situation or opportunity or problem I'd like to solve. And then it gave you a framework against which to place it. And so we heard some people talk about the me or the we, right? This this impacts me and it's on my desktop and it's a system I use, or it starts to to branch out and be a we. It, it, it's me interacting with a supplier or a vendor or a customer or a different functional department in the organization. And then it, if that becomes sort of a yellow or a red, then, then yeah, you're a citizen scout. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Let's put a plan together. If it's worth solving, we'll solve it. Um, if it is closer to the green, then you're a citizen automator, developer, data scientist. And if we have the tools and the support system, then you go about solving that problem for yourself. Um, and then as, as, as you touched on, and as, as Tom mentioned too, we, we have this 4G framework that started with Genesis and I'll come back to that in a moment, but then it included guardrails or governance, guardrails and guidance. Uh, because we didn't want to appear like we were just being cheerleaders of this mass citizenry movement where everyone should be given all of the toys to play with and all of the freedom to to touch systems and play with data because as you Burn said down the it department that's Defund right the, the yes. CPO. <laughs> yep. um long live citizens and so um that is a recipe for potential disaster almost certain disaster because these are folks who who haven't been brought up in the the world of of change control and and risk and cybersecurity issues, and so they'll they'll step step into potholes without knowing it and and create a great deal of damage. And so that is why we asserted that there needs to almost be sort of two ITs. There needs to be the IT that continues to keep the enterprise systems running and upgraded and working and safe and secure. And then there needs to be that element of IT that is doing the the guidance and the nurturing, the training, and and maintaining these these sandboxes in which people can safely be developing solutions, and you know, and, and maybe having a set of stage gates where you can't push anything into production until we've reviewed it and it's met certain criteria that you may or may not be aware of because right because you're you're not close to our our data. Um, laws and and regulations, um, but that's take all the take all the IT um, professionals with high levels of emotional intelligence, and that's we right. put them in the citizen facing roles. <laughs> right, because because they will be 
they will be supercharged and you will you will experience a great deal of digital transformation from this grassroots innovation movement um, if you allow it. One of the risks, which you know is is a, a different sort of risk is one of the risks is you take your creative problem solvers who really do have a passion for creating solutions and you tell them they can't do anything. And one of three things happen. They go into the shadows and they do it anyway, hmm. or they automate what they're doing for you and they go off and they, they get other jobs. We came across an entire community of people who are um, effectively gaming the system and, and uh, celebrate getting job two, three, four without their employers knowing it because they just can. Or the return to office movement is um, um, casting a little cold water on that, that ability to hold on right. multiple remote jobs. Yep. It's using, hard to be on. It's yeah, hard to be on multiple calls. Tools. Yeah. Sitting in your cubicle. But the, the third risk is those good people just pick up and leave. Hmm. Right? This is an environment that isn't AI friendly, that isn't enabling them to bring their ingenuity to work so they pick someplace else to work yeah that, um, I, 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 yeah Charles i see this playing out every day yeah. um you, tom you already made the point that not every citizen development initiative is successful i'd love to get your take on the common patterns that you have observed when things go wrong so what what are the patterns and failures um, well, I think um, there's just sort of uh, failure to thrive where um, it takes off very slowly or, you know, citizen um, activity is largely voluntary. And so if you're not um, getting people excited about the opportunity and mobilizing a, a number of people and making available those sort of genesis oriented approaches of, of launching and training and and marketing and so on then it will just languish in organizations and and not really take off in the way that it could um uh theoretically there could be a big um disaster where someone uses data in the wrong way or or um, uh, develops a mission critical application and leaves the company with no documentation. As I say, we didn't see that type of failure, but I think people are, are worried about it. Um, with large scale democratization, I think um, uh, anybody involved in data governance starts to get quite nervous. Um, we talked to someone in that role at Microsoft and you know, Microsoft um, has both a set of tools that it offers its customers that it wants to use internally to you know, eat its own dog food or drink its own champagne. And also they have a CEO who's out there um, talking and writing articles about how great citizen development is. So it mm -hmm. does make the data governance people nervous that someone is going to create, I don't know, a new definition of, of um, profitability or revenues that um, could cause problems with the financial markets. It hasn't happened. Um, and they are trying to develop um, tools that they and their customers can use to prevent that sort of thing. There are you know, certain protected data elements that you, you can't use without explicit permission. But um, it's a, you know, a type of failure anyway that, that could happen. Tom, wasn't there a quote about handing sharp objects to children? <laughs> yeah, in the, in the um, data science area, we had a... Um, uh, head of data science at a health insurance company who said, um, I asked him, um, you know, what do you, I've known him for a long time. I said, what do you think about this whole citizen data science movement? And he said, we generally prefer not to give sharp knives to children. <laughs> um, uh, but even he admitted that, you know, the knives that are available to children um, are getting sharper and sharper all the time. And he was mostly worried about people not understanding the data and not um, doing something that's really of regulatory importance that industry is highly regulated and getting in trouble for that. Um, and he said it hadn't happened yet, but it could happen in the future. So he wants to try to prevent it. Yeah, and to some extent, I share that concern because we've had this now for a long time, this whole space of democratizing data analysis. And if we are now 
getting to a stage where the AI is doing all the heavy lifting, then we need to make sure we understand some of the limitations of these tools. We need to understand some of the biases in the data. We need to, some of the, the, the basic understanding of data science and, and that is a challenge, right? It is. I think it work. These things work best in um, organizations who have a lot of um, um, data-oriented people to begin with. So Shell has a lot of engineers. Johnson and Johnson has a lot of you know PhDs who did um, research work um, uh, analyzing data um, in their in their careers. Um, uh, we talked to um, someone who was involved in. Um, uh, Mass General Hospital, where they have a lot of doctors who are quite data oriented uh, because they're researchers as well. So in those environments, I think there's less to worry about. A, a, a person at Microsoft said, for the most part, the people who are exploring this are, you know, they're, they're doing marketing analyses or something like that. You know, if you get one of those wrong, the implications are not terribly severe. No, I can see that. But I can also see areas where it might be very dangerous. So if you think in the healthcare setting, if a nurse decides to use AI to analyze patient data, for example. Well, and that's what's interesting about the 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 knowledge gaps, right? Because if you have um, a nurse who is building a model that's around a, cust a patient's data, that nurse may, the nurse's gap is in the capabilities and and uh, challenges, I suppose, with the technology, right? It's still hallucinating. It still can create some some pretty sort of wonky answers. Uh, who better to to validate the data than than somebody who is as close to it as possible? So the nurse is actually the expert in the data, but not in the AI algorithms, and so that's where it behooves us to both train those practitioners, those domain experts in the power of the tools they're using, but also measure their expectations. Otherwise, there was an example I read recently where you, people were throwing PDF contracts into a large language model and then interrogating the large language model based on the contracts. And it was giving them answers, but it was hallucinating those answers. And they just assumed that the large language model knew all and was accurate. And so you can, that can create issues at scale if you're not conscious, if you're not informed that some of these AI tools aren't perfect yet. Yeah. But, you know, I, um, Bernard, I think of this in some ways um, like um, doing your taxes in the sense that um, we have tax professionals. Um, I, I assume um, most countries have them. Um, our system in the U.S. is incredibly complex. Um, I um, have used tax professionals in the past. I um, was a partner at a couple of different big four firms where you could get it done by their tax professionals for free. Um, uh, now I just use TurboTax, which I think is you know the, the world's best computer program. It makes mistakes. I make mistakes, but the tax professionals made mistakes too. Mm. And you know, back to your example of healthcare, um, yeah. say you know a nurse figures out that that you can create a predictive model for sepsis that might cure some patients. And, uh, you know, it might not be perfect, but the, one of the world's leading electronic health record companies also developed a predictive model for sepsis that was actually not very good. Um, and so professionals can make mistakes in these spaces as well. Mm. So if you were advising someone starting their career today, how would you suggest they prepare for the citizen revolution? That's a great one. Um, and I think that some of that falls into the guidance component of our framework, which is first and foremost, it, it helps if it helps if they're an expert in the process that they're doing, which obviously that they inherit over time as they're doing their job. Um, I think most people are, I mean, everyone is digitally native in so much as they're used to technology now. I mean, I'm watching my children run circles around me, mostly while well, scrolling various different channels I should not allow them access to. But um, that's, a, that's a different topic, Bernard. Um, but it is that awareness and consciousness of, of data, of just of process 
really of understanding how to break these anything that you do into steps so that you can analyze where opportunities exist in those steps um and then just a we kind of we break down what makes for a citizen developer and there were three categories and one of them was skills it was it was the skills that they have in data in process and understanding how to work with large language models or or agentic large action models nowadays as well uh, but the other two were mindset and personality traits and so the mindset and the personality traits really spoke to are they are they creative are they even willing to just challenge convention and just say, there's a better way to do this. And when someone says, but this is the way we've always done it, they don't just sit down and go, okay. They, they step up and go, but why? It feels like there's a better way. Um, so I would argue anyone coming out of university today should look for those enterprises that, that give that sort of behavior support and encourage it and um, and to to bring their digital nativeness to bear on whatever they do, because most industries and one I literally just had a, a chat with somebody just right before this call about the accounting industry. Uh, one of the major accounting universities or programs just near me here in Florida sees uh, CPA or accounting graduates in their accounting program down 40 percent. Right. There is a so back to the accounting that Tom brought up. There is just not enough talent in some of these industries, and so the people who do know the job are going to have to step up and find ways to augment themselves, to develop these digital twins and cobots and um, and other agentic capabilities that allow them to take what they bring to the table and magnify it and do all the routine, mundane, transactional things that automation is well suited for to support them. Yeah, and Bernard, I think I think um, the current situation is actually kind of liberating in a way because you always had to make a choice: do I um, go for a particular business function or do I go for um, technology, um, IT? And you know, we um, had programs in both, and you really had to choose. Now, I think no matter what business function you would like to go into, whether it's accounting or human resources or finance or supply chain or manufacturing or whatever, there are really important technology related aspects of that. And that means, um, I think, unless we're going to commit educational malpractice, we have to train students, not just in that particular business function, but also in how to build technologies that, that support um, different um, and address different problems within the, those domains. And I think people's careers will be much more fulfilling than they were before. They'll get to solve business problems and use this incredibly powerful t set of tools to, to do it. Yeah, and I, I share this optimistic view as well. Um, what's the one message you hope readers take away from all hands on tech? For me, it's um, this is an incredible resource. You know, every organization today feels the need to digitize. Um, it's taking too long. It's costing too much. There aren't enough professionals to do it. And you have this very powerful resource within your company of people who have domain expertise and can learn the skills if they don't have them already necessary to develop technologies. You know, I was a... Um, a uh, process person for many years. I wrote a book on business process re-engineering and so on. Um, uh, now, I think thinking, as Ian was suggesting earlier, if you're thinking about how to improve a process, you can actually do it yourself. Um, you can develop a, a workflow, an automation, um, even you know a set of tools that might support an entire uh, re-engineering project without having to wait for, you know, professionals to, to have the time to do it. It's, it's all um, very exciting. It is indeed. Um, I can't let you go be, be, without asking you about future trends. So I'd love to know both of your take on the future trends in business and technology that you are seeing on the horizon that you are particularly excited about. Ian, do you want to kick this off? Uh, happy to. So um, I'm a sort of a pragmatic futurist in so much as I've watched lots of exciting waves come and go. 
and leave leave components of themselves behind. So RPA was, I mean, outsourcing was one that I spent some time in my career and continuous improvement was one. RPA was one. Intelligent automation expanded on that. Um, and now Agentix, this idea of AI agents is catching everybody's attention and everyone is changing the way they sort of describe what it is their AI tools do uh, to be Agentic. And I think that's an amazing opportunity but it's also an incredible responsibility because mm -hmm. what it does, the, 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 the core concept behind Agentix is really very narrow AI. Agents that do a very specific component of a workflow extremely well. Now that takes what used to be a person doing a job and then a person in some automation doing pieces together to now an atomized process end to end that could be 15 different agents and certainly still role for human. And so I think the future is going to be about a really sensible orchestration of those two components, the best AI for the job and really well-informed capable humans. Um, often the ones who are identifying the opportunity for the best AI for the job, which is the citizen movement in its, you know, in its entirety, it is domain experts understanding they can apply tools to make things operate better. So I, I think the sort of agentic business automation movement is going to be spectacular, but you need to recognize that it's not replacing humans wholesale. It is a orchestrated combination of great humans and great tech. Yeah. And I've just interviewed the head of AI of Salesforce and what was interesting is that he, his, his vision of the future was that we all have multiple agents in the future working mm -hmm. on our behalf, connecting with agents of other companies, and they're all making decisions together. And this mm -hmm. requires considerable amount of, of guardrails in place to make, make sure that, that they oh. don't go off and do crazy stuff together. It should make your head spin. The concept mm. of just these dozens to hundreds to thousands of little independent geniuses doing their part is interesting mm -hmm. but from a governance perspective it is uh it's very complex mm -hmm. and tom what are your trends that you're excited about or are you keeping a close eye on well I, ian and i are doing some work together on the whole agent thing and i wholeheartedly agree in fact i would argue that um uh with respect to ai um we don't particular generative AI, we really um, are neglecting how to make humans better users of it. And uh, people who you know, exercise critical judgment on the outputs of it and who you know, learn how to um, get the best out of it through various prompting strategies and so on, um, all of the attention seems to go to the technology and what big technology breakthroughs there are and as Ian suggests, you know, um, ways to squeeze humans out of the loop um, rather than thinking about how to use them more effectively. Um, the other thing I think that I'm quite excited about, and we saw some of this in this um, All Hands on Tech book, is how it's going to change, how um, these tools are going to change entrepreneurship. And that, you know, I teach at Babson, which is always rated number one, at least in the U.S., for entrepreneurship. And we're really trying to figure out how do we train entrepreneurs to use these tools to build their businesses in very different um, ways than we have in the past. You know, people are starting to talk about, you know, the, the one person unicorn company worth a billion dollars, but um, able to do everything with, with um, uh, citizen um, tools and AI and so on. I don't think we're there yet generally. And I think um, there will still be a role for more than one person in entrepreneurial organizations, but I think you can certainly accomplish a lot more than you could in the past without these tools. And how that turns out, I think is going to be um, very interesting, both in um, technology areas and in anything um, that involves um, digital capability, which is almost every, every business these days. Definitely exciting times ahead. Um, thank you so much, Ian and Tom, for joining me today. That was really, really enjoyable.